Hello, good evening everyone. You should be able to uh, hear and see me now. Um, my name is Michelle Batty. I'm the project manager of the European Reference Network uh, that's known as Eurogen. And we love to collaborate in Eurogen, so it's, it's a real pleasure this evening to uh, introduce a joint webinar uh, between Eurogen, Ernica and the European Paediatric Surgeons Association. And of course, the webinar program is co-financed by the European Union. Um, I just want to say a few words about the reference networks. One of the major aims of the reference network is to speed up the diagnosis of patients with rare diseases. And one of the services offered by the ERNs is uh, we can um, offer advice to healthcare professionals who might be treating a patient who they suspect has a rare disease or a complex condition. You can go to the ERN and request advice. Um, and we can share medical information on a secure platform uh, to make sure that the patient information is fully protected. And we can perform a kind of European level MDT and issue the advice to the healthcare professional requesting it. So it's the advice that's traveling, not the patient. Um, so look at our websites for further information about that, but we're fully operational and we would uh, welcome inquiries from healthcare professionals across uh, the European Union. Um, so without further ado, it's a real honour and a privilege uh, to have two fantastic clinicians here presenting with us this evening on Vactorel or not Vactorel, does it matter? Uh, so first speaking, we have uh, Carlo Michelis, who is a clinical geneticist at the Department of Human Genetics at Radboud University Medical Center in the Netherlands. Um, and since 2007, he's been involved in research on genetics on intestinal atresia with a focus on anorectal malformations and bacterial association. Um, and following that, we've got Prof Ernesto Levo, who is Director of the Department of Paediatric Surgery uh, at the Polyclinic of Milano. Uh, so without further ado, thank you both so much for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. Uh, and I do encourage the audience to ask questions. And uh, please, uh, over to you, Carlo. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that everybody can see my screen and I hope it's the right screen, but Darren will probably be able to tell me. I think it is, yes, as far as I can see. Yeah. <laughs> Good, thank you. Um, thank you, Michelle, for introducing me. And I'd first like to thank you as an organizer for inviting me to share my experience and opinion on a complex multiple congenital anomalies disorder called Factile Association. Let's see, um, my PowerPoint doesn't work like I want to, but I have to go somewhere else, I think. Yeah, that's better. I have no conflict of interest, so I can talk, I think. <laughs> Since its original description in the early 70s, there has been a lot of debate on the criteria needed to make the diagnosis of factorial association. Kahn and Smith originally described this the non-random co-occurrence of vertebral anomalies, anorectal malformation, esophageal atresia with tracheoesophageal fistula, renal dysplasia, and radial anomalies. And later, cardiac anomalies were added as a feature to form the acronym of FACTAL. Other authors have suggested an expanded association, including genital defects and single umbilical artery. Can't. Yeah. To make this diagnosis, it's important to look beyond the single congenital anomaly and keep the overall picture in mind. From whatever angle you look, it should be possible to recognize the elephants and not to be a blind scientist. No formal set of diagnostic criteria is available yet, but the general expert opinion suggests that the presence of at least three component features is needed to establish this diagnosis, as is described by this paper by Solomon et al. from 2010, uh, I think. Often it is suggested that at least either an anorectal malformation or esophageal atresia with fistula should be present. 
we have also tried to contribute to this discussion. And with this study by Romy van der Putten, who defended her PhD thesis on Vactal in October last year, uh, we uh, have tried to start a new discussion. Uh, the aim of our study was to describe clear diagnostic criteria and investigate the frequency of component features and possibly describe subtypes of factile. For this, we collaborated with the EuroCAT registry. Uh, the European Network for the Surveillance of Congenital Anomalies, called EuroCAT, is a network of population-based registries of congenital anomalies throughout Europe. And member registries report their cases annually to the central registry, which is operated at the European Commission's Joint Research Center in Italy. Uh, in our study, 28 of the included registries collaborated uh, to uh, study Vactal association. Uh, we predefined a detailed a classification of congenital anomalies that were considered to be part of Vactal in which we made a distinction between major and minor vactile features. Major vactile features are congenital anomalies that are part of the classical vactile association, and minor vactile features are congenital anomalies not typically, not typically seen in vactile cases, but occurring in one of the organ systems that are commonly affected among these cases. For example, uh, looking at segment uh, on the vertebral defects in Vactel, these are usually segmentation defects, while uh, uh, sacral anomalies uh, are often present in patients with ARM uh, in, with anorectal malformation. They are not classical for Vactel association. For the cardiac anomalies, uh, we often see septal or conotruncal defects in patients with Vactel, while isolated valve dysplasia is unusual. Uh, abnormalities like an open ductus botali or a patent foramen ovale is, are also often described as a congenital heart anomaly in patients suspected of factile. But when these abnormalities are present just after birth, they should be uh, uh, described as a classified as a normal variation and not as a congenital anomaly. Looking at the renal abnormalities, renal dysplasia or agenesis are considered the typical renal abnormalities in Vactel, while obstructive urinary defects with possible secondary reflux are not typical for Vactel. Uh, in the EuroCAT registry, 501 cases were registered as having Vactel. Uh, 397 of these fulfill the Vactel criteria. And within this group, we have uh, predefined three subgroup. Uh, the 213 patients in the strict Vactel uh, group have three or more less, uh, uh, three or more major component features. Uh, 82 are Vactel like with less than three major but with additional minor features. And 102 cases we call Vactel plus because they have an additional major congenital anomaly outside the Vactel spectrum. In the total Vactel group, the most commonly observed Vactel features were anorectal malformation and, and esophageal abnormalities, both in over 60% of the cases. And this was followed by cardiac defects, renal defects, vertebral defects, and limb defects. When we also include the minor Vactel features, all Vactel component features were observed in minimally 62% of the cases, except for the limb anomalies, they were present in only about 30% 30, 30 of the cases. There are some minor dif differences in the distribution of the anomalies between our series and with previously published papers, especially the limp anomalies seem to be less frequent in our series. But the overall distribution is rather similar. Now, I'd like to switch to what we know about the etiology of Vactel. The vast majority of Vactel cases are sporadic, but incidental familial cases have been described, like in the paper by Hilger et al. that described, described a girl and her maternal uncle both fulfilling Vactel criteria. An interesting paper on this subject is a paper by Solomon et al. 
Right? They have studied the family history in a large group of Fatal cases, and in 9% of the patients, family members have competent features of Fatal, but they do not fulfill the Fatal criteria by themselves. It has, this at least suggests that some genetic features are important in these type of anomalies. There are some what we call known genetic causes of, of Fatal. And many different chromosomal anomalies have been described in these patients, uh, in patients that fit the diagno diagnostic criteria of FACTEL. Some of them are recurring in known syndromes like trisomy 18, 13, or 21, or 20Q11 deletion, uh, also known as the George syndrome. I think that when we diagnose a diagnosis like this, when a patient has trisomy 18 or trisomy 13 or whatever a diagnosis, uh, they should be called Edward syndrome or Patau syndrome or Down syndrome and no longer called Vactal association. Most of these chromosomal abnormalities are found in single cases and usually these patients have additional major abnormalities or developmental delay and what we would call Vactal plus. So many of publications on chromosomal abnormalities have been published and this last publication by uh, Brose and et al. Uh, they review chromosomal anomalies published in Vactel cases and as you can see almost all of these uh, cases are single cases or single families and not recurring in other patients. There are also genetic causes known or described for Vactel syndrome and many different candidate genes have been identified. And most of them uh, are de novo mutations uh, with an autosomal dominant inheritance but also, also autosomal recessive forms, X-linked forms and even uh, patients with mutations in the mitochondrial DNA have been described. All these genes were identified in a limited number of cases and no single major gene has been identified yet. Most of these studies studied either a limited number of candidate genes in a larger group of patients or used larger uh, broad techniques like whole exome sequencing in a limited number of patients. We wanted to study a large panel of candidate genes in a large number of patients, and this resulted in a publication uh, from last year uh, in an international collaboration. In this in a collaboration with uh, collaborators from Germany, Italy, uh, the United States, and other centers in the Netherlands, uh, we have gathered a total of 211 Vactel cases. And we have also added 204 patients with anorectal malformation and 96 with esophageal uh, atresia that do not fit the Vactel diagnosis, diagnosis, but we have added them to the study. Uh, we have used studied these patients using the MIP technique, and that's a, a laboratory technique that allows us to study a large number of candidate genes and a large number of patients for a reasonable price. Uh, we selected a targeted panel of candidate genes. Uh, 26 of them were genes that result in human monogenetic disorders that share features with Factile syndrome and Factile association. 10 of them were candidate genes previously published in relation to Vactel. And 20 were genes that, when mutated, cause congenital anomalies in three or more Vactel organ systems in, in mouse models. So a total of 56 genes were uh, selected. In seven out of the five uh, of the 397, no, of the 510 patients we studied, pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants were identified. So that's only a small number, only in 1.4%. Three of the uh, mutations were found in the cell one gene uh, that is known to be involved in Towns Brock syndrome, which has a very uh, variable uh, presentation uh, that shares anorectal malformation and, and thump uh, abnormalities with Factel uh, association. 
uh, two other mutations are found in cell 4 uh, that has previously been described in Duane radio array anomaly. Uh, that also uh, includes anorectal malformation as one of its features. And two other mutations were found in the MID1 gene that is known to be involved in the OPITS-G or BBB syndrome. Only one of these mutations was found in a patient classified as factor L+. And the other six mutations uh, were found in patients with isolated anorectal malformation or anorectal malformation plus an additional feature. No mutations were found in the patients that we would uh, classify as a strict factor. An important limitation of our study is that we had to pre-select candidate genes and our select, selection is likely to be incomplete. So our, so our study will miss possible new genes. To be more complete, we could use whole exome sequencing, but that still is too expensive to use in a large group of patients. And several research groups have already used whole exome sequencing in a smaller number of cases, and they were not able to identify major factor genes. In our clinics, we now offer whole exome sequencing as a diagnostic test to every new Vactel case. Uh, in the Netherlands, this is possible because this can be paid for by the health insurance company of the, uh, of the patient. And that's probably not the case in many other countries. But uh, this has not helped us to identify important new candidate genes yet. But we hope that when we have studied enough patients uh, this way that might make it able for us to compare that, their genomic data and to look beyond uh, our limited number of uh, selected genes. Now, what I also think is important to discuss is there's an important differential diagnosis of Factel. And many syndromes share clinical features with Factel, especially uh, in the Factel Plus group. And there are many clues uh, to uh, such a syndrome. Uh, patients can have non vactal anomalies, uh, they can have dysmorphic features, uh, developmental delay, or a positive family history uh, that can help us and identify these. And both monogenic syndromes or chromosomal anomalies can be found. Uh, recognizing these syndromes is, I think, very important because this can impact on future health of the patients. And it can also provide us with a different recurrence risk in families. Um, I want to start with two cases uh, to illustrate this. The first case is uh, a boy uh, who was born with tracheoesophageal uh, atresia and uh, tracheoesophageal fistula. He also had a ventricular septal defects and a unilateral renal dysplasia and was found to have bilateral thumb hypoplasia. In addition to this, he also has tosyndactyly and microcephaly and uh, short second and fifth digits with a clinodactyly of the, of, the, uh, uh, in the, of the little finger. And here you can see the syndactyly of the toes. Now, does this boy have factor L? Um, you could discuss he has, because he has four component features, the C, the TE, the R, and the L, so he would fit with the diagnosis of factal association. But he also has additional congenital anomalies that are not typical for factal. So we would call this factal plus. In this patient, we did perform DNA analysis because we had a clinical suspicion of a specific syndrome. And he had a mutation in the MEC engine, and this mutation is known uh, in other patients with what we call the Feingold syndrome. Feingold is a rare but well-known syndrome combining uh, gastrointestinal atresia, especially a cervical atresia or duodenal atresia, with typical digital anomalies. Patients have uh, short uh, middle phalanges of the second and fifth uh, finger, they often have syndactyly of the toes and they can show thumb hypoplasia. Uh, they also can have uh, cardiac abnormalities or renal, renal abnormalities, but they also show microcephaly and dysmorphic features and often mild to moderate intellectual disability. 
An important difference with uh, Vatel association is that this syndrome has a Feingold syndrome. And the family of this patient also showed this because when we look back at the mother of this patient, these are her hands and uh, uh, her hands and, and, and feet. And the feet show the typical syndactyly of the toes of the second and third and the fourth and the fifth toe, but also short middle phalanges of the, uh, of the uh, Think of the, the, the fifth finger and the second finger. Our second case was a girl who was born with an anal atresia with a rectovestibular fistula. She also had a ventricular septal defect and an absent radius or thump, as you can see uh, on these pictures. In addition to these abnormalities, uh, she also has growth retardation. Uh, her growth is on the minus uh, uh, three as, as a standard deviation and uh, a mild microcephaly. Now, again, does this girl have Factel? She has three component features, the A, the C, and the L. So in this way, she would fit with this diagnosis. But growth retardation and microcephaly are unusual in cases with Factel. So again, we would call this Factel plus. In this patient, we did a specific chromosomal test, a mitomycin test. Uh, treating chromosomes with mitomycin causes chromosomal breakage, and increased breakage is suggestive of, a of the diagnosis of Fanconi anemia. And we found this increased breakage in this patient. Uh, later on, we did perform DNA analysis and found compound heterozygous mutations in the Fang A gene, uh, confirming the diagnosis of Fanconi anemia. Well, Fanconi anemia is a multiple congenital anomaly syndrome uh, that includes uh, abnormalities like radial aplasia, uh, heart defects, and anorectal malformations, uh, as is seen in Vactal association. But they also often have growth retardation, microcephaly pigmentary abnormalities, and can show malignancy, uh, malignancies, a tendency to malignancies, especially hematological malignancies. Um, this syndrome has an autosomal recessive inheritance. So recognizing this syndrome is important, both for the counseling of the family, because there could be a uh, recurrence risk of 25% for future children, but also for early detection of hematological malignancies and that would give better options in treatments, including possible bone marrow transplantation. Now, is Factel a genetic condition? That's one final question I would like uh, to I ask myself and I would like to ask you. Um, well, I don't know. There may be subsets of cases who will have a genetic condition and future studies are needed to look for them. But to be honest, I don't expect to find one major genetic cause. But still, it remains important to recognize factorial association. And why is this important? Because recognizing, I think from a genetic point of view, it's especially important to recognize this diagnosis, but also the differential diagnosis. Uh, this is important for counseling of the patients and their family and for follow, clinical follow-up of the patients. On a scientific note, uh, if we really want to study the etiology of uh, Vactel syndrome, Vactel association, we need a homogeneous cohort of well-phenotyped Vactel cases. Without that, it's probably difficult to uh, perform uh, good genetic testing. From a surgical point of view, it's also important to recognize this syndrome, but I think in the next talk, Ernesto will tell us about this. So, I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, want, to, uh, want to thank our collaborators all over the world. And uh, we'll hear from Ernesto what he can tell us. Okay, thank you, Carlo. I'm just going to make uh, an estimate presenter and you can share his slides in a second. We're going down to share my screen. I'm allowing you should get the message now, hopefully. Okay. Great. Excellent.
Okay. I hope you can see. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Eurogen and the, the Eurogen team that invited me to do this presentation. But I also want to thank all my colleagues that works with me that uh, helped me to prepare this presentation. And I mean uh, Antonio Di Cesare, Anna Morandi and Francesca Maestri who helped me to prepare this, this presentation. So the question is, uh, factor or no factor, does it matter? Uh, good question. Uh, I have no conflict of interest. Uh, Carlo told us which are the associated anomalies that usually we can find in a patient with anorectal malformation. So the idea for this presentation was uh, what uh, I have to do as surgeon when I have a patient with anorectal malformation. Because uh, we know, as Carlos told us, that there are associations, uh, if there are more than three defects associated to anorectal malformation, we can consider the bacter. But uh, why do surgeons look for bacter anomaly in a newborn? Um, so once we have a baby with or a newborn with an anorectal malformation and the baby is born with anorectal malformation, uh, our attitude must be to have in mind the word bacter. And why? Because through bacter uh, acronymus, we can uh, look for the associated abnormalities. Who can change our management uh, of these patients? Um, because uh, are there uh, associated anomalies that treat in the baby life and should be dealt with the right away? Asked uh, Mark Levitt. I think yes, because uh, uh, most of the, uh, some of the, the, the associated anomalies we have to assess within 24 hours. That is especially for the cardiac anomalies and for the esophageal atresia and tracheosophageal fistula. But there are also other anomalies like severe nephrological anomalies and uh, hydronephrosis that must be addressed in the first uh, 48 hours. So sometimes anorectal malformation move in a second line compared to the associated anomalies. So once we have a baby with anorectal malformation, we have to um, switch on the idea that we have to uh, do the screen for Bacter. What does it mean? It means that we have uh, something that must be uh, done urgent. So we have an urgent screen, for example, for cardiac. Echocardia, echocardiogram is advised for all patients because critical isonotic heart disease or critical isonotic heart disease can uh, um, impact with the surgery we have to perform in this baby. And again, uh, uh, these uh, comorbidities carry higher mortality rates and should influence the cardiorespiratory stability during the neonatal surgery. Uh, sometimes it needs for cardiothoracic surgery and sometimes uh, uh, we need a colostomy in any case uh, because of the, um, and delay the anorectal reconstruction because of the cardiac defect. So if we have an anorectal malformation with severe cardiac defect and esophageal atresia, for example, thoracoscopic approach for uh, esophageal atresia are not always possible and we have to proceed with the uh, left thoracotomy uh, that may we need. So as you see, bacter, some comorbidity of the bacter can impact in a, in, a, in a severe way in the management, in the surgical management of this patient. Again, uh, especially in patients with esophageal atresia, X-rays is also important because simply passing uh, a nasogastric tube and taking a thoracoabdominal X-ray, we can assess esophageal patency. But in, in, in the meantime, we can uh, look for the anatomy of the vertebra and the ribs, and we can uh, also study the anatomy of the, of the column. Um, in uh, esophageal atresia, with or without fistula, uh, may lead to premature baby or intrauterine growth restriction. And this should uh, influence the respiratory stability of the newborn that requires uh, urgent ligation of the uh, fistula. So sometimes, again, anorectal malformation go move in a second line of treatment. Um, again, we know that uh, newborn with imperforated anus and esophageal atresia requires longer neonatal surgery, and more likely they have a complex anorectal malformation. As you can see from this uh, paper, 
50% of anorectal patients with prostatic fistula and 60% of cloaca in female. Uh, abdominal ultrasound is urgent, but I would say is a semi-urgent or hemi-urgent screening. In any case, uh, especially in patients with uh, cloaca, help us to see and to detect the presence of a mass, that means either corpus, and also the kidney and urinary tract can be studied. Of course, we have to aware the physiological liguria of the newborn, so we have to assess this uh, ultrasound uh, with an appropriate timing. And what is non-urgent, of course, is the clinical assessment of the limbs. Uh, that is done any, in any case in all patients, but uh, run lower and upper limb x-rays uh, if needed uh, uh, compared to the macroscopic uh, uh, evidence of, of the defect. Uh, is the ultrasound of the spinal non-urgent? Uh, of course it's not urgent, but I personally believe uh, in a certain way is also urgent because uh, thanks to the spinal uh, cord ultrasound, we can detect some severe anomalies of the vertebra of the spine or the spina that helps us to give uh, uh, to the parents an idea about the continence in the future of this patient. It must be done, of course, in the first two months of age, someone say in three months. In our center, we prefer to do usually at birth. But as I said, to detect a defect in the spina is very important because we can have a, a favorable type of anorectal mass formation with the severe associated anomalies in the vertebral in the spine that completely change the future for continence of this patient. If we cannot have uh, uh, the ultrasound or in your institution, there is not a possibility to have the ultrasound. Of course, the MRI of the spinal cord and column is advised, uh, advised if abnormalities were detected uh, by ultrasound or not. So in our center, when we detect a, a defect uh, by ultrasound, we proceed with MRI. MRI, especially in the newborn, can be done without general anesthesia using the feed and wrap technique. And again, to study the anatomy of the vertebra, especially the pelvic bones evaluation and the sacral ratio, is very important for us to tell to the patient from the beginning with how many chance is having this patient to be continent for feces and urine in the future and uh, how uh, severe is the defect uh, of the anorectal malformation. So uh, does impact vector association in the surgical management? Uh, um, we can think about the lesion. Carlo told us about the lesion of uh, gene 2022 or syndrome like Moll syndrome or Pax mutation, I don't know, I, I don't remember all the name, but the question is, uh, is this type of uh, association of comorbidities uh, impact on the surgical management? Everybody of us know the algorithm how to treat uh, a patient with anorectal malformation, if to open a colostomy or not, if to do a primary repair, so everybody of us know these things. But this is the key of my presentation, arm as anomaly in a newborn with or without uh, uh, other comorbidities, surgical strategies and appropriate timing depend on those comorbidities. So every surgical plan must be tailored on the single patient. I think we cannot generalize uh, this type of malformation required this type of treatment. It depends about the situation of the patient. If the patient is having comorbidities and type of comorbidities impact on the treatment, on the surgical treatment, so every surgical plan must be tailored on the single patient. Of course, the priority are on the cardiac defects. Sometimes we have to delay in timing of anorectal plasty. Sometimes anorectal surgery is not possible due to the incapacity of the patient to undergo to surgery. That means uh, what we usually treat in the first three months of life, we have to postpone later and uh, but of course heart is having the uh, major role in the treatment of these patients. Esophageal atresia with tracheoesophageal fistula uh, can also impact in the treatment of this patient. First because uh, um, 
uh, the, the, the surgical time became longer than usual, but uh, we can have some advantage of it. Um, and sometimes we can decide to perform a primary repair or even for complex anorectal malformation that in our centers we started to do since five years and we call primary repair of rectal urinary fistula. So where we usually do a stoma, we prefer to proceed with the repair of the henus using the fact that the patient are in the post-operative period with oral fasting. So again, this type of malformation should change our, our idea and, our, um, and the way we treat these patients. As I said, the vertebral and the spinal anomaly must be known before surgery. And this also impacts uh, about uh, the type of surgery we decide to perform. If the rectal prolapse is more likely to be expected due to the anatomical defects, surgical strategy can be implemented during an rectal malformation. What I mean? I mean that uh, sometimes if we know that the vertebral and spina are compromised, it's better to anchorate the rectum during the anorectal plasty uh, in a different way, in a stronger way, or decide to perform the anoplasty a bit tighter than usual because the prolapse uh, is one of the problems we can face in the follow-up. So also the anorectal uh, anoplasty should, uh, uh, should change uh, related to the vertebral and spinal anomaly. Uh, urologists are a big problem for us, uh, dedicated to anorectal malformation. Sometimes we fight in, uh, in uh, theater to preserve the uh, appendix. Uh, I kill three of my colleagues urologists because they want to have the appendix and they want to have for Malone procedure. So also there are some surgical procedures that uh, change because they use the appendix. But moreover, what is really important for us as surgeons dedicated to anorectal malformation in well, is when they have to uh, do a cystoplasty, a augmentation cystoplasty, where they use uh, a small intestine or much worse uh, colon. So as surgeon, we have to face with the urology, we have to discuss with them, and we have to decide what is crucial for us and what is crucial for them. Um, so does it matter as neonatal vector or no vector? During the neonatal, neonatal period, the surgical plan is not affected by vector diagnosis itself, but by the severe associated anomalies that can develop in urgent or emergent clinical and surgical issue. So butter screen, in my point of view, in our point of view, a screen must be done in every patient with anorectal malformation. Uh, Alberto Peña and Mark Levy described a lot of associated anomalies and syndrome uh, uh, related to anorectal malformation, so it's not, uh, it's not a matter of vector. Uh, uh, it's not only a matter of vector, and as I said, all type of syndrome, soft type of comorbidities must be uh, associated with arm and all surgical plan must be tailored for the patient. And um, so the, the, and the question is Vactor or no Vactor, does it matter in the end? I would say it's quite important during the uh, neonatal management and uh, sometime during the surgery, but it's crucial during the follow-up because uh, uh, especially with patients where we know that there are uh, anomalies in the urinary tract, we have to protect the renal function. Uh, again, despite to the type of anorectal malformation, when we have associated the severe anomalies in the vertebra or in the spina, we have to set up appropriate bowel management uh, and uh, uh, sacral and spinal abnormalities are pivotal in the assessment of this patient. And moreover, we have to plan appropriate, appropriate surgical multidisciplinary follow-up based on anatomical defects. So neurosurgeon, orthopedic, gynecologist, and urology are the leader, are the main actor in the follow-up of this patient. Recently, I would say we changed, we add some other figures. Um, for example, also Carlo talked about intellectual disability. Uh, I'm not sure that this, uh, this aspect is related only on the presence of actor or non actor. We have to think that this type of patient receives three anesthesia in the first six months of life. 
and the position we use uh, is uh, something different for them. So we started to follow up this patient also in a um, uh, neurological development uh, and uh, the scolarity is one of the points we are facing with problem now and uh, I think also that probably we have to change uh, the type of uh, monitorizing uh, uh, we use in theater during this operation when the patient are in prone position with head down and the, um, the perfusion of the brain can be changed during the, the long procedure, procedure we have to do. So I believe that uh, in the future more and more specialists must be uh, added in the follow-up of this patient but for sure Vector is guiding us what is, which is the best way to do. I thank Luna Rosa for everything he did. Thank you very much. Thank you Ernesto. Um, okay so uh, Time, we've got some time for questions. Um, just uh, as people ask questions, um, if you can indicate whether you want it to, if the question is for Ernesto or for Carlo, that would be great to help me. <laughs> um, so we've got one through here from Evo. Um, that's for Carlo. I'll send that one to him. Okay, that's a question for both both of you. I'll send it to Carlo to start with. Carlo, are you okay to put your video, can you put your video back on, Carlo? Is that okay? If I can, uh, I have a question for Carlo. Can I do that? Yeah, you can ask him. Yeah, to say if we get his video on, hopefully you can. <laughs> Carlo, my question is, uh, um, my question is, uh, um, when yes. we face uh, with parents that have uh, uh, received the diagnosis of anorectal malformation, uh, this is a tragic moment for the parents because they expect everything. Uh, of his uh, fetus, uh, three arms, uh, four nases, uh, big hands, but they never thought that they you know, should be missing with this patient. Do you think it's important uh, during this time, this counseling, that also the genetics are involved since the beginning, or should be a second approach from the genetics? That's a good question, and uh, I think it's exactly the uh, the question that was also uh, uh, asked to me by uh, uh, by the uh, by uh, in the chat. Uh, should all patients with an anorectal malformation be seen by a geneticist? Um, I think, especially the patients who have additional anomalies next to an anorectal malformation, yes, they should be seen by a clinical geneticist. Uh, to see if there are additional features uh, suggestive of a different diagnosis. Uh, but also patients with an isolated anorectal malformation, it can be helpful to, uh, uh, to show the, the, the patient to uh, a, a geneticist and have them talk uh, to the parents. We, we, because we can also give information uh, about inheritance, about genetics, about recurrence risk, even in an isolated case of anorectal malformation. And sometimes the additional anomalies that can point us to uh, a specific diagnosis can be very subtle. And uh, as a geneticist, we are trained to recognize uh, minor facial abnormalities or minor abnormalities of the hands and the feet that might not be obvious to uh, a surgeon or a uh, uh, or a urologist or whatever uh, other uh, clinician has been involved in these patients. So I think uh, it would be a good idea uh, that a clinical geneticist is involved in every patient with an anorectal malformation, especially when there are additional anomalies. Question is, if that should be done in the first few days or weeks, I think, uh, in most cases, it can also be postponed to a later date, uh, especially in the patients with an isolated anorectal malformation. Does that answer the question? Yes. The second short question is, uh, um, do you think we have to get closer to the association of the parents uh, and probably make meetings uh, on both sides, surgery and uh, genetics, uh, with the parents to explain uh, what we have to follow up with these patients. You mean, uh, should we see these patients together? Yes. 
not so only simple, simple. but uh, mm -hmm. make uh, meetings uh, with the parents association oh yes certainly that is that can be that that is can be very helpful and uh, here in nijmegen uh, uh, the, the the pediatric surgeons try to organize that on a regular basis that uh, that we see uh, uh, patients and, and especially the families uh, together in groups uh, to discuss this yeah okay thank you okay um we haven't got any other questions we've got some thanks to you both for the presentations so uh um, well um just while we're waiting for anyone else want to ask any more questions please do now we've got another seven or eight minutes um just while we're waiting on that i'll say again thank you to ernesto and carlo for the presentations thank you all to for attending um just to let you know that you can find further information about our webinar series um and certainly more information on the forthcoming arm webinars as well on on our website um there's a list of them on there if you look and there, there's something on our front page now which will link you to the list of the webinars um we put the, the, the um, links on you usually create them a couple of weeks in advance of those dates so you better register a couple of weeks in advance if you want um you'll also find lots of other information on our website about works that, what your agenda does and can do um so yeah uh, thank you again but if there's any other questions no, nothing else at the moment so if anyone thinks of anything afterwards i should say that as well um please don't hesitate to send me an email i will uh, pass the question on to uh, carlo uh, and or ernesto uh, and to gather a response um the other thing i should say is that if you missed any of this i know some people i see some people joining during the presentations uh, there will be a recording of the webinar which will be placed on the go to webinar platform which you've used to access uh, this presentation and we'll also put it onto our youtube channel as well uh, which features all about almost all of our past webinars as well you can find them there uh, we've suddenly got a lot of questions uh well a few through um one through here i was going to forward it to you carlo uh, <laughs> if that's okay um yeah. okay that's now okay okay um the question is uh if we do know about non-genetic causes of vactel so like environmental or medication vactel um, in this uh, thesis by uh, Dr. Van der Putten that I showed you some articles uh, about, there was also uh, an important part of that uh, of her thesis was on maternal uh, uh, risk factors uh, in the occurrence of vactal association. And uh, I'm not an epidemiologist, so for me it's not easy to uh, answer uh, that specifically. Uh, I have the thesis here, so I'll, I have to look at that here. There are some risk factors known. Uh, it's a bit more likely in, let's say, uh, twin pregnancy. Uh, so we see that more often there uh, it's more often present in patients and mothers who have overweight so we can see it more often there uh, and uh, maybe also the lack of folic acid use uh, and smoking can be risk factors for vactal but still uh, with more studies are needed to really uh, prove that these, these studies are uh, being performed I'm not really the right person to uh, to answer that. I think. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So, if anybody's got anything else, give me a couple, give me another sixty seconds or so, just to uh, something else in. Yeah. Um, So hopefully the um, I also, um, yeah I'll send out the link direct link to the recordings tomorrow hopefully so if he's aware including the YouTube one we do a bit of editing go first <laughs> so hopefully going out to that in the morning um, but if anything so anything afterwards please don't hesitate to contact us and uh, we'll also email you because um, you've signed up for this one now if you haven't signed up once before we will inform you of your forthcoming webinars as well um, once they're available for registration. Um, so again, um, yeah, I don't think we've got anything else to do. A few more thanks, which I'll send on to you, uh, Ernesto and Carlo, so you've got them. Um, but yeah, I'll say thank you again to, to you both for presenting.
uh, both excellent presentations. And thank you all for attending um, uh, this webinar. And uh, hopefully, um, you will be joining uh, with us in the future. Um, so I'm going to close the webinar in a second. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.